Uh, going on to the definitions of what we, what we look to to income and the exemptions, and there's some issues I have a number of concerns with. Uh, if you look at page one of the bill and lines nine through 11, it indicates a term of outside income shall include wages, salaries, fees, commissions, and other forms of compensation for services actually rendered. You know, many people would agree that would be uh, probably an appropriate definition of what income is. My concern is, is when you go to page two of the bill, lines 15 through 17, and that says that the following terms shall be exempt from outside income, and that includes income derived from the profits of a business, firm, corporation, limited liability company, partnership, or other business entity due to the membership's ownership interests. Correct. So here's my concern. Let me give you a hypothetical. A person could be a member of a law firm and you know, maybe acting as a counselor as an employee to a law firm, and under the first definition of in outside income, they would be limited to approximately $77,000 a year. But let's say they decide to get clever and say instead of going and being an employee of the law firm, they decide to form their own personal corporation, or LLC, which now contracts with that law firm for the services. So the law firm then pays this LLC $200,000. The person could then say, I'm the sole member of the LLC, so therefore this is a way of me getting around that income limit. That's a concern that I have. Well, under the proposal, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the notion here is that you have to, that we, we, we make the relationship to actual services rendered. Correct. So even if you were to create an LLC, uh, you would be subject to the limits if you're the sole owner of it because it would be, uh, it, it, would be it would be obvious that you've created the LLC for the entire purposes of taking money in, and then what you'd find is the provisions that relate to referrals and other fees without actual work done would be prohibited. So while this section is intended to capture investment, so the notion here is that if you do work, you have to demonstrate work. If you're paid for work, you have to demonstrate you've paid work. If, however, you have an ownership interest in a corporation, you're an equity partner in an investment, that the investment activities, or effectively, you might argue, the passive activities as an investor would not be subject to the income guidelines. But if you set up a, an LLC for the purpose of actually just transferring money and without work performed, first of all, you'd be captured by that provision. And if you didn't do any work, then by simply setting up a corporation, it doesn't avoid the responsibilities for having to demonstrate actual income. And the concern I have here, I think that should be the intent. If a person is getting some sort of passive income investment, we don't want to preclude that. People may have investments and they do suddenly well one year and you shouldn't preclude them from income at this point. My concern is, I'm just concerned the way the language is drafted here just creates that ambiguity. Again, for the exact reason that I do, creates this LLC and saying, hey, because, and here's where I'm going down with this path. You may say one part says the income is the services rendered, but then this exemption to me is just so wide, a person could at least make that argument. And but if there's gonna be an ambiguity, it's gonna be in favor of the person saying, hey, this is the way the law was drafted, I'm gonna take advantage of it. That's a concern I have about the drafting. Well, I appreciate that, um, and I, we've gone back and forth around the specific language to make sure, to your point, right. that those investment activities are not captured. Um, but I think in, in the real world, I, I'm struggling to understand, even under your construct, what the LLC, 100% owned by this individual, what they would argue was the work that they had done in order to receive compensation or income for it. It's not simply then an investment. There's no investment because there hasn't been any investment activities. There's been no activities by the LLC. I think it would be interpreted um, as either an illegal gift or compensation that would be prohibited under the other sections of the law. Just one other concern, too, is that, okay, let's say a person, instead of just being this employee of the law firm, is, let's say, an equity partner of the law firm, okay? The firm does other types of incomes along those lines. Would then they be able to earn more than the $77,000 by saying they formed the, the law firm 25 years ago, has been equity partner for that entire time, and as part of the partnership agreement, all the partners share the profits at the end of the day, whether you work 10 hours, 100 hours, because of the work put in for 25, 30 years. In that case, uh, my reading of the law, and as I believe our intent was, 
because you're an equity partner, right. because you have a percentage ownership, because it's profits derived from that investment activity, unrelated to actual work hours performed, mm -hmm. that that would be exempt under this bill. So yes, as long as you're an equity partner, and as long as it's you know absent after you derive from your basic income and subtract um, all the uh, cost of doing business, whatever the, the residual profit is, you would get, again, no greater share than your equity ownership in the, and this would apply not only law firms, but any corporation, that that would be an exempt activity and come under the investment heading rather than the actual work or services or billable hours work performed. Okay. Um, let's go on to the fact you're talking about referral fees for attorneys in those divisions. Um, going to the bottom of page two, starting with lines 47 through 51, and it talks about division of fees, and it talks about this section only applies to those in the practice of law in the state. And it says a member who is engaged in the practice of law in the state shall not divide a fee for legal services with another lawyer who is not associate in the same law firm unless such, law for, well, such lawyer performs legal services and the division of fees in a proportion to the services performed by each lawyer. Now, this provision is actually not new. Uh, this actually is already contained in Rule 1.5, subsection G of the Rules of Professional Conduct for Attorneys. That's correct. In its current form since 2009, but in other forms since 1970. And my concern is as follows. That states that you cannot receive referrals from another law firm. Okay, I'll give an example. You are uh, attorney Atticus Finch, for lack of a better name, works for ABC Law Firm. Then there is Law Firm M, which he would then also refer, receive referral fees from this. This statute would say that law firm M, which you're not a member of, can't go and give you referral fees unless you've actually earned the work and everything is done in accordance with the disclosure. But let's talk about ABC law firm. You could be at ABC law firm. You could be of counsel to ABC law firm. You would do absolutely no legal work whatsoever. All you do is receive clients and you get a percentage of the worth clients come in. Again, not performing a day's worth of work. The way I read this, that is not obtained by the language you have in lines 47 through 51. Well, it may not be in 47 to 51, but it is in other portions of the bill. Okay. Where, again, it gets to the question of the actual work done. So whether it's payment for referrals or whether it refers back earlier uh, to income derived, you have to actually do work performed. It cannot be a referral. You'd have to demonstrate whether it's a, whether it's a work you've done within your firm or whether it's work done with another firm. You have to demonstrate actual work performed in order to receive income unless it's, as, as I earlier stated earlier, unless it's investment income. Could you point, because that's where I'm trying to find out this, because the language, which again you point out, is something the legal profession has had for many years. Again, if it's from another law firm, you are certainly going and restricted. But if you are a member of that same law firm, and currently, under the rules of professional conduct, there is no constraint on an attorney. As long as you're a member of that law firm, some people's jobs at the law firm aren't actually doing the work. They be, are rain, rainmakers, for a better lack of the term, just the way that some place set up, okay? I, but I'm not a rainmaker, trust me on that. So You are with me. I, trust me on that. <laughs> but I think I need bigger umbrellas, but I'm not making any rain. <laughs> so may I? Yes. May I, yes. So the section that you're referring to relates, as you said, to only attorneys in practice. Right. But the section prior to it, which I would point you to, which is uh, paragraph three, lines 35 through 44 of page two, a member of the legislature shall not receive a salary or any other form of payment or compensation from a firm, corporation, limited liability company, partnership association, or other entity firm for use of his or her name in the name of the firm or on a firm's letterhead website or promotional material unless the amount of such compensation, payment or compensation directly related to work actually performed by the member and the amount is reasonable when compared to similar payments customarily charged in locality for similar, similar services or such payment or compensation is proportionally based on an ownership interest in the firm. That relates to all forms of economic activity, including attorneys. So while the other sections specifically relate to attorneys, this captures all firms, including attorneys. And so you would not, to your point, 
be able to simply say, I'm a rainmaker, I refer people within the firm, but I don't actually do any, I don't perform any services, and we believe it's captured under that provision. I'm just going to respectfully disagree with my interpretation. We will agree or disagree for the reason that the way I read the section you just brought out was for a person receiving salary just for the sake that his name is on the letterhead or that they are just receiving the website and people think you're there. If you're actually actively going and bringing clients and people coming through you because they know that that's firm you may have worked, you may have once done, or your firm once did, to me it's a distinction between solely having the name on the letterhead or actively bringing a client to the other partners of the firm and then receiving money. Just well, a disagreement. No, I understand your point, yeah. although I would say what, you, the, what you've just described is effectively what the bill says because it's the use of the name. So if you go to a, as I understand the point you're making, if you go to a law firm and you say, Tom McKevitt, I know him, he's a big deal in town, um, and therefore I'm going to call you and Tom says, look, you know what, I'm going to refer it, whether it's within my firm or to another firm, uh, and I'm going to take a piece of the, you know, uh, compensation, or however that's determined, um, simply because I'm Tom McKevin and you came because you knew my name. That would be covered under the section. I think it's what you just described. No, it's not. <laughs> what I describe is just the fact your name is there. If you are a person who's saying, hey, you know, you know people in the community, and they'll go and they'll call me up and saying, hey, I want to use your firm, and using for me, I'm not there just because I'm a name on the letterhead and does nothing and collecting a fee for it. I actually get a percentage of clients they bring in. There's a distinction between having your pretty name on a letterhead and receiving 10% a year or a certain amount of money or getting one third of the clients you actually bring in. You may have good years, you may have bad years. That to me is the distinction between those two sections. It's, again, we, we're not just going to agree to disagree on, on the complexities of language. So. Well, I'm, uh, we will agree Great. to disagree. Correct. Uh, and I will also take a look at the language to see whether or not uh, it ought to be tightened up. But I, sure. I understand your point. Clearly, from our perspective, we are trying to capture what you described. I think we have. Um, but I'll, uh, I'm happy to look at it and see if there's a way of tightening it further. Mr. Speaker, on the bill, uh, certainly we all want to go and have uh, ethical reform and reforms in Albany. There's certainly been enough news stories in the last couple of years, which makes everyone in this chamber look uh, in a negative state. I agree with the majority leader. I think the vast majority around the people in this chamber are good, hard government people and shouldn't be punished for that. Um, but I will be supporting this bill in the spirit of reform, but I think there's a lot of uh, technical changes which I think need to be made in order to go and make this bill effective. So uh, for that reason, I'll be voting in favor, but encourage further developments on this issue. Thank you. Ms. Corwin. Thank you, Mr. Sp uh, Madam Speaker. Um, would the majority leader uh, rise for some questions? Yes, sir. Or yes, ma'am. Of course. <laughs> it's okay, sir. So we're losing it here. I, and I apologize. I, I tried to follow what our colleague was getting at, and I think most of his discussion had to do with attorneys and their issues. But he raised an important point that I thought might be applicable to non-attorneys outside income. Uh, when he spoke about in, uh, an individual attorney being in a law firm, setting up his own corporation, uh, LLC, and um, instead of taking um, uh, fees, uh, takes a profit from the company. And I understand where that gets addressed in your bill. The question I have, though, is with a sub-S corporation where the individual is not an attorney. Uh, for example, we have members here who own small businesses, um, dry cleaners or uh, pharmacies. And uh, that person is the 100% sole proprietor or owner of the business. Um, they have employees. They pay their employees. They, you know, sell goods. Um, but rather than taking a salary, decides rather to take no salary and just take all the profits from the company. Would that, um, that, comp that compensation would count, would, would not get counted, am I correct? Uh, that's correct. We make a distinction, again, between... Um, a salary or compensation and wages for work actually performed as separate and distinct from investment. So if you were a subchapter S owner, 100% owner, and chose not to take a salary, um, but instead allow those profits to stay within the corporation and at some time take a disbursement for your investment, that would be not calculated as part of the outside income. Okay, so it does kind of create an, an end run around that limit. If, I mean... I, I do know sub-S corporations where they do, that's exactly what they do. They don't take 
for cash flow reasons oftentimes will not take a salary and then just take the profits at the end of the year. And like I said, if it's an individual, um, you know, it could be quite sizable. Um, but. Well, it could, but again, you'd have to disclose that so people would know there'd be transparency in it. There's already transparency around that. And uh, I guess to your point, if your intent is to avoid the, the, the outside income by making sure that it, you translate it into an investment, um, you know, what we're trying to do is make sure that those passive investors um, in various activities are not prohibited from taking that investment uh, back out um, and s instead trying to ensure that to the greatest degree possible you need to earn the money either through active in which there's a cap or this investment um, and I suppose we may find at some point in the future coming back to amend it if we can determine that there are people who are uh, in some way engaged in conflicts and they've avoided disclosure but I, I think it's a pretty rare instance and typically with subchapter S's or others you would not be a sole proprietor. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. Typically, the subchapter S's are a number of parties that would come together just in the same way that an LLC is, although it's not a requirement. You're right under law. Sure. sure. Okay. Uh, just moving on. Uh, when we talk about deferred compensation, and I'll reference uh, page two, line seven, uh, it says here, uh, part three, capital gains or payments from a pension, deferred compensation or retirement plan. Uh, now, uh, my read of that says that uh, any kind of payments you take from your deferred compensation plan would not get counted as income, and I understand that. Um, does it get counted, um, and let me give you this example, if you are um, you're on a board of directors of a public company and you, uh, c you receive stock as your compensation for the services you provide to the company, that stock is in a restricted stock fund that you can't access beyond, until after a certain age, 10 years after you've earned it. So does that compensation count? Because my concern here is that, you know, if you're on that board, you can accumulate quite a bit of compensation for services rendered, but now you're not realizing that compensation for many, many years. So I'm just trying to understand how, <laughs> I know I hate to throw these things at you. Well, but. so for services rendered, you, you mean by serving on the board, you're compensated for, what you, for your purpose on the board, for right. what you do on the board. So uh, I should probably confer with counsel to make sure, but if you're getting compensation for serving on the board, that's in, a, in effect a salary and that service is actually rendered, which would be captured under this. Um, the investment portion, so the stock ownership um, is investment, but you're saying you get paid by stock as opposed to getting paid right. a salary you're during getting, that period of time. You're getting paid by stock at the time that you provide the service, but you, you're really not realizing it as compensation until uh, 10 years later then I would, when you cash yeah, out. Yeah, I think if you're still a member of the legislature when you go, when it becomes time to receive that income, while that may be deferred income, it's actually from services earned or, or activities performed and therefore would be captured um, as opposed to deferred compensation where you make investments into um, some kind of pension plan and simply get it back. What you're describing is deferring payment on activities actually performed, which would constitute income and therefore would be subject to the outside limits. Okay, so it would limits. be counted at the time that the services are rendered. Correct. Okay, that's, that clarifies. Yes. Um, council makes a, a point I just want to make. If it was performed for activities prior to service in the legislature, that would be not be included. But what you've described is while you're in the legislature and you're sitting as a member. Right, yes. Okay. Exactly. Just wanted to clarify. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, also, um, I don't believe, but I just want to confirm with you that the bill doesn't address anything having to do with um, some of our internal rules here in the House. Uh, for example, we provide stipends for uh, chairmanships. Uh, none of that is addressed in this bill. Well, actually, it, it's addressed only that it says that uh, it is an exempt uh, income. It's outside salary benefits and allowances paid by the state, line three of uh, okay. page two. Okay, so if, uh, and, and what I'm getting at here is, and, and this speaks to my larger concern, um, our salary here has been set uh, in the Constitution. It's at 79500 Now we're talking about limiting outside income which, according to this calculation today, would be approximately 77000 
So what we're basically saying is that uh, as an individual serving here, you can only earn all in uh, whatever that combined total is. That's 150,000, something like that. Well, I'm sorry. I, I was just gonna continue. Yeah. So in terms of getting a raise or, or earning more income, because as you know, our income doesn't go up very often. And now you can't get a- I have noticed that. <laughs> I think most people in this room understand that. Now we're saying, okay, you can't make any more money on the outside than that limit. So basically, we're freezing people's total compensation at a certain level. And my question is, is well, how do you, you know, as time goes on and years go by, how do you get a raise? Well, the way it works right now, the only way you can get a raise is if you are fortunate enough to be given a chairmanship or some sort of other leadership position that provides a stipend. So I guess my concern here is we're talking about capping outside income, but I'm not entirely sure if that's a positive or a negative impact on us as members because our independence, we're giving up because the only way we can get a raise is if leadership bestows that on us. So I think that's, I don't know if that's such a good situation because now we're making people even more beholding to leadership because they're the source of our raises. Does well, that still hold true in this bill? Well, I'd say a couple of things. The, the Constitution doesn't set uh, our salary. It's set by statute, although the Constitution prohibits an increase during the, the term of election right. or the, the uh, term that you're elected to. So you could certainly see the income by legislators going up. Um, we have a compensation commission that will review uh, the appropriate compensation levels. But there's also, even the outside income is limited by 40 percent of the New York State Supreme Court salary and as you know that has actually gone up from time to time i believe currently there's a, a schedule for uh, increases so that would um be adjusted for that amount as well and look i think this is the balance that we're all trying to understand you know the public um, clearly is concerned about outside income we're concerned about it but by the same token we don't want to unduly impact an individual legislator's ability to earn outside income, which is why we've set this um, um, this relationship between um, the Supreme Court justice and a certain percentage. I'd also say this, that because it does not impact um, income that is derived from investments, that there are other ample opportunities for legislators to do that. But I, I get your point, which is uh, there may not be a perfect answer to this, but this is, we believe, the best way to get at limiting conflicts and making certain that individual legislators perform their individual responsibilities to the public first and foremost before the influence of any outside income. Sure, and I respect that. And certainly this is a challenge. Anytime you're dealing with people's compensation, it's hard to take into consideration all scenarios. But I think at the end of the day, we have to acknowledge that the way we compensate, compensate people, whether private sector or public sector, you're incenting certain types of behavior. And I think we have to be very mindful of the kind of behavior that we are incenting. To me, it doesn't matter if the cap puts you at 77,000 or 150,000 or 20,000. The problem to me is, is that there's a freeze, basically. And the only way to improve your situation for your family is if you fall in line more with leadership. And that's my concern, because I look at the public and I think, especially with this national election going on right now, it's clear to me that the public, A, they don't trust government, but B, they want outsiders, they want people who are independent. And if anything, this bill would make us less independent. And that is my greatest concern. What I would suggest to you is that um, people don't want to see uh, outside compensation or outside uh, influences uh, causing our legislators to do bad things. I don't think that's the problem. The problem is, is, that, is that if we disclose what we are doing outside and what our relationships are with private companies or firms or so on on the outside, we can accomplish that goal, but at the same time allow people to uh, continue to work and, and uh, gain experience and so on in the outside world. Well, I, I think your point is well taken. I think we all acknowledge uh, that there will be sacrifices to serving here, and I think we uh, accept that as part of uh, taking our oaths. Um, I do note that there is a cost of living adjustment built into judicial salary, so there will be some uh, movement in that direction. And ultimately, it's not the leadership's decision 
uh, that would increase your salary. It's the, it's the decision by both houses uh, and the governor because we're obviously able to change compensation or appoint a compensation committee to do it. And I think at the end of the day, you know, your perspective, I, I understand your point. I, I guess I would say that from my perspective and, and hopefully for a majority of members here when we take this vote, that doing this limitation will restore faith in our government. It's badly needed, and this is one clear, uh, concrete way that we can uh, demonstrate our commitment to the public interest first and foremost. Thank you, Mr. Morrell. I appreciate that. On the bill, Madam Speaker? On the bill. Thank you. Uh, it is very challenging to deal with compensation and outside income and so on and try to capture the right behavior that we want on the part of our members. Um, I do want to just make one other point, and I didn't want to make Mr. Morelli stand there for the whole time, but uh, we have to keep in mind, too, that the type of members that this will uh, foster going forward. I mean, we talk about ourselves and the situation we're in right now, and we all know where we come from and our backgrounds and our experiences. And I think that one of the positives of our body is that we do draw from many different walks of life, people with varying degrees of experience in various different areas. How this compensation plan works out or how this rule works out will have a huge impact on the kind of people who will run for office going forward. Uh, and that's my concern. When you look at members, if you come in here and you know, well, you can only make 79500 plus the 77000 outside, uh, and if you get a chairmanship, which is a very hard thing to do, you'll, maybe you'll get a little mo extra money than ten grand, or you, know, you get to head up a task force, that's five grand, whatever. That's your only source of, of increase. Consider also what happens after you've been here for 10 years, 15 years, and that's all you're doing. At some point, you may actually want to leave the legislature. You may decide this isn't for you anymore. You may not agree with what's happening inside. You may lose your election. What kind of experience do you have to fall back on when you go back out into the private sector world? Now you've been 10, 15 years out of the workforce. Your only experience is, is doing this and you haven't been able to foster or cultivate anything outside really because you haven't been able to grow and develop with your outside income either. So I think we have to be mindful of where we're going with this. Um, while I understand the, the need to rein in or, or somehow regulate the relationship between the outside job and what we do in here, I think there are other ways we can do it more effectively through disclosure. So um, I am gonna vote for the bill as well. Uh, there are some great things in here regarding the lobbyists can't wait to, to vote yes for those. Uh, but I do recommend that we consider uh, the outside income portion and maybe try to rework that into something more effective. Thank you. Mr. Tedisco. Would Mr. Uh, Morelli yield for some questions? Yes, sir. Mr. Morelli, uh, usually when we pass legislation and laws, if somebody breaks those laws, there's a penalty. What's the penalty for breaking? Uh, let's say the law where you're supposed to make 70,000, it's 80, 90, 100,000. Yes. Uh, the penalties are those existing penalties under the public officer's law. What part of this says that uh, if you break the law and it's a felony, you lose your pension? Uh, the, um, the provisions that relate to pension forfeiture uh, are in the Constitution and would require a constitutional amendment. And as I think we have stated many times publicly, uh, myself and other members and certainly the Speaker, our goal and intent is to uh, pass an amendment that would uh, be first passage of a constitutional amendment, but it could not be in a statutory bill um, because the Constitution is amended differently than statute is amended. So there is no recommendation for reform today for someone like the speak, previous speaker who uh, game the system, didn't live up to his oath of office, but still gets a $90,000 pension. That's not before us today. And uh, is there any plans for you to bring that out in the future sometime? That constitutional change, law, amendment? Yes, uh, pension forfeiture is something we intend to bring to the floor. We have a uh, resolution, a constitutional amendment resolution in print. We will take it up and we continue to talk to our partners uh, to reach an agreement. And I uh, have every confidence we will do that before we leave uh, in June for the end of this session. Now, Breet Bahara, who was the federal prosecutor, in talking about our previous speaker and some of the things that were done, he mentioned that we were all enablers. If we see something, we should have said something. I'll be honest with you, I didn't see anything. 
I didn't know where all that money was that he was giving out in grants uh, to uh, game the system. I don't know if you did, I hope not, and I hope many of the members didn't. Uh, that's called, I guess, discretionary funding. Is there anything that's coming before us today to create more transparency? Because that's another, uh, an important byword, uh, something that was used when we started to talk about what you put before us, uh, to allow us rank and file members, not the leaders, because I, I think the leaders, the speaker and the majority leader and the governor uh, knows where these uh, pockets. Uh, the pockets are what the Citizens Union, and Mr. Dady said, was 80 pockets, I guess a week ago, $1.4 billion, where we don't exactly know where and when it's going to be spent. And uh, sometimes we know there's a pocket of money. We don't see it on our websites in a clarified way for us to see it. And I'm wondering if there's uh, anything in what you've brought forth today to create some transparency, because uh, League of Women Voters, Citizens Union, uh, Empire uh, Organization, uh, uh, several good government groups have come forth to ask for more transparency in these uh, bundles of money that rank and file members don't seem to have access to or seem to have an understanding of where that funding is going to be spent, or neither does the public or much of the media. Uh, I'm not a forensic budget scientist, and neither are my colleagues here. We'd like to know where that funding is and what, what it's designated for. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last end of that just as you got to the question part, I'm sorry. Well, I, would, the I, I just missed the last line you said, I understood. I, heard I think everything. it begs an answer, the question be begs an answer itself with what I've explained. Is there anything here that's a reform that sheds more light, more shun uh, sunshine? Because when you shed some light, our representative democracy seems to flourish. If we don't see that light and we have a, a spending in the shadows, we get darkness. And that uh, uh, darkness in democracy uh, only diminishes it. Well, and I, I think your question relates more to the budget process. Um, and trying to ensure that there's the greatest degree of specificity in the budget. We'll continue to endeavor to do that. It's not anything in this because this is a bill that relates to the activities of a member, conflicts by a member, outside compensation by a member, and, and other reforms that I've described um, as it relates to making certain that we do everything we can to specify particular appropriation of the budget. We always endeavor to do that. We'll continue to do it. Um, the Speaker, the, major or the uh, Chairman of Ways and Means will continue to do that um, and to make certain to the greatest degree possible that there is specificity in the budget as we pass it. Let me ask you this, Mr. Morelli. Over a year ago, uh, I guess Mr. Hasey, the present Speaker, uh, appointed uh, a reform caucus. And uh, is, is this part of the report, or is this the part of the final report, or is this the final report of that reform caucus? I guess it's led by Mr. Kavanaugh and Mr. Pretlaw, and uh, everybody received a letter uh, over a year ago outlining what the questions were that were going to be answered when that reform caucus reported. Uh, I don't see any of the answers that were asked in, in that letter sent out, which I have a copy of here, uh, in these reforms you brought forth. Has that caucus completed its work and sent recommendations to the entire uh, uh, Democratic conference? Well, let me just clarify. I think what you're referring to is a working group that the Speaker appointed to look at improving transparency within the House um, and, uh, and looking at ways to make certain that we have greatest, the greatest degree of accountability. I do know that we are uh, anticipating changes to our internal rules. Uh, the increase of greater amounts of technology that would not be dissimilar uh, from the work we did last year uh, to improve uh, the use of electronic means for aging bills, et cetera. So there will be a number of changes forthcoming. This is more about statutory changes that relate to all members of the legislature in both houses. Uh, it relates, obviously, to loopholes in uh, campaign finance, relates to the use of political uh, campaign housekeeping funds, et cetera. So, they're not embodied in this, but there will be much more over the weeks to come uh, that will be the product of, of that internal working group. The so speaker what appointed. you're telling me is, I don't know, is the answer no, they haven't completed their work and provided a, uh, a report to your uh, conference? No, my answer to it was that there is work, well, let me say this, that it doesn't relate to the bill on the floor. Okay. I've, an I've answered that. And what I've also said is you will see in the next few weeks, I think, in terms of 
timing a number of additional changes to our rules, et cetera, uh, that will be the work product of the, the internal work that we have done.